encouragement from being united with Christ. Listen to that. Isn't that awesome? If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, that sounds like something we ought to be doing. Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only on your own interest, but also on the interest of others. You see, folks, what I'm talking about when I just said we have to have a new mindset. You may have been coming to church, going to church for know, years and years and years and years. But I'm telling you, for so long in the church, I believe God has not been pleased. Just going to church, singing a few songs, hearing the word of God, and going home and just, I can't wait till God takes us in the rapture. God is telling us right here, you have to look at others more so than yourself. And that's not something easy to do. I know it's not. I battle with it myself. So when I'm here talking to you folks, I'm talking to me too. Okay? And my message title today is Fellowship, listen to me, Fellowship in the Interest of Others. Fellowship in in the interest of others. Okay? So today when we're done here, you may ha need to want to skip out of here. But how about fellowshipping in the interest of others? Amen? Lord, right now. Hallelujah. Lord, let your will be done. I pray here today, God, that you'll touch and you'll move and you'll speak to us. And Lord, that we'll change, we'll change Lord. That we'll walk out of here with a different mindset today. Hallelujah, let this mind of Christ be in each one here today. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. The biblical Greek word for fellowship is koinonia. Koinonia. And it is usually, it is translated to, in the English, to communion. Or to fellowship. Or sharing in communion. And partake. <clears throat> The usage, give me a little bit of monitor, please. The usage of Greek words belonging to the Quinn Quine, Quine family refer primarily through, not invariably, to participation in something rather than association with others. Okay, hear me now. What we've been doing for years is associating. All right, we need participation. Amen? And there is often a, po a possessive word, genitive, to indicate that in which one participates or shares. You see, folks, sharing or fellowship arises out of the common sharing of something. And this is Christian fellowship, sharing together in Jesus Christ. And many times... Scripture speaks of sharing or partaking in Christ together and the effects it should have on us. Now, the Bible makes clear that our fellowship in Christ should lead to what? Unity. You see, it's hard, folks, to be uni have that unity if all we do is bump in here for uh, an hour and a half on Sunday or maybe two hours and, and an hour on Wednesday. You see what I'm trying to say? It's hard for that, and the enemy knows that. So the less he can get you to come to church, the less he can get you to fellowship, he's got you where he wants you. So the fact that we are in that we share in Christ is the most important thing about us. It is a bond that we need to continually take to heart and to practice. So even communion is not just a ritual, 
But it is a symbolic demonstration what should be a communal reality. So we practice communion, in, in, which is another word for fellowship, so that we can remember Christ together. Why is fellowship important to believers? Number one, it brings glory to God. Fellowship brings glory to God. Fellowship, folks, is part of God's creative design. Hear me. Don't just miss it. Oh, here we are, fellowship study, uh, you know, small group study. I'm telling you, fellowship is part of God's creative design. The Bible says he would walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. He would come down and walk with them in that garden. He was having fellowship with him. God, uh, God created man to have relationship with man, not just to say, oh, I created something else. God desires fellowship. We are made in his image. God created man with a desire to have relationship with him. So understand that today, folks. When the devil tries to tell you God doesn't care about you, say you're a liar. God wants to have relationship with me. And when you have relationship with somebody, you care about them. You want to help them. Are you feeling okay? Or how are you doing today? Now look, when we're just walking down the street and we, somebody, we walk by a bunch of people, hey, how you doing? How you doing? How you, doing? you don't stop them and say, hey, you doing all right today? You feel okay today? No. You're just, you're just, hey, how you doing? But when you have, when you have a relationship with somebody and you see that they're not being their normal self, you're like, are you feeling okay today? Why? Because you care. And the enemy doesn't want us to care about each other. I mean, we're going to care because we call ourselves Christian. We come to the same church. We're going to, but you don't really know that person. I mean, you, you see me say this many times. You walk in. We, a lot of times, many of us, we were even late here today. We'll come in. You, so we didn't have any fellowship before service. A few of us did. And now after service, and unless you go downstairs, you're not going to have. Some of them are going to fly out that door. And there's not that really communal relationship. But when we start having the communion and, and, and the fellowship and the small groups and, and, and the church services and all these things, we start caring and looking and, under, and we see, hey, that person's not normally how they usually are. Usually when they come in here, they're really worshiping God. Are you okay? Can I pray with you? The devil doesn't want that, folks. The devil doesn't want that. So we are to reflect God's relational character by having a relationship with him and the church. From the beginning, God clothed man as a symbol that they were his people. And throughout the history of mankind, God initiates with man that they would live in a relationship with him. Jesus commanded us to love one another. We are able to resemble Jesus by being his followers and being in uni unified relationship with God's people. He had relationship with his 12 disciples. John would, by, you read, John would lay his head on the chest of Jesus. I don't know if I'd do that to you, Adam. But I do love you. <laughs> man, you know how men are, man. How you doing, man? But I know this man loves me, and he knows I love him. And many of you here, you know that. I'm not going to lay my head on your shoulder or, or your chest or your shoulders. I'm not going to do that. I mean, it has to be a pretty, it has to be hurting, bro. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm, you know, it's it, you know. But I'll do that with my wife. You see how relationships are, folks? But it's more, we need more than just this pop it in here, uh, uh, maybe just on Sundays, or, you know, some of you, many of you thank God to come on Wednesdays, amen, but we need this, but God understood that, and thank the Lord that John could feel that need to lay his head on the breast of Jesus, but the, and that just shows me what God thought of relationship, amen, 
So because of God's love for other people, we, we will now uh, be like him and be his disciples and disciple other people. You see what it is? God did something, folks. He went and picked 12 disciples. And God wants us to disciple also. Amen? So Jesus is glorified when we live as the people he has called us to be. And what it does, it brings glory to God when we are in fellowship because that is how he designed us. We fulfill his created design and thus glorify him when we live to be as he created us in fellowship. John 17, 20, 23. Neither pray I for these alone. Who did he pray for there? His disciples. But for them also which shall believe on me through their words that they are that they all may be one as thou father art in me and i in thee and they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me and the glory which thou gavest me i have given them that they may be one even as we are one in I, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them, and thou hast loved me. What's he saying here? I'm praying for them, that all those that are saved through their words, and that goes on down the line, folks. It's to us today. John 13, 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Okay? We also, we need each other. We need each other. We live in a, very, a world that is very hostile toward God. Amen? And it's not getting better. The life of Christian requires a perseverance. Amen? For, for it is he who stands firm until the end that will be saved. In other words, he that overcometh. Those are the ones that are going to be saved. The scripture tells us. Loving our brothers and sisters in Christ is repeatedly co commanded in order that we may encourage each other to run the race well. That we may not fall away from Christ. That we may experience help in times of weakness. That we may model the character of God to one another. How many have been blessed by somebody saying, I'm praying for you? How many have been blessed by somebody walking over to you during worship service and laying their hands on you and God is helping you? You see why we need one another? Because you're not going to get it in the world. This is not to say that in all relationships we, we fellow believers are easy. I'm not saying it's easy because our bonds have such depth. Okay? We, there's some people that we just have to pray hard to be able to get along with them. But as long as we're trying, and as long as we keep saying, God, bless, and move. But on the contrary, folks, relationships with fellow believers can be extremely difficult, which is obvious by a number of exhortations toward unity written in the New Testament. They talk a lot about it. And even though unity with the fellow believers can be extremely difficult, we need to renew our minds and do our best with the Holy Spirit help to live accordingly. Philemon 4. And through seven, I always thank my God when I pray for you, Philemon, because I keep hearing about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people. And I am praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. Your love has given me much joy and comfort. My brother, for your kindness has often refreshed the hearts of God's people. There's just some people it's easy to love. But there's others that are difficult. And he was thankful for the love of Philemon. So what does fellowship look like practically? As seen in the passage above, it is about attitude and 
action. Attitude and action. In other words, what is your action towards your attitude? Come on. Well, I know we should do it, but come on. My attitude, I don't want to mess with it. Oh, come on, pastor. Really? Because we are one body that has been called to spur one another on, to love one another, to be one with each other and the Lord, we need to have this mentality. Amen? We need to have this mentality. Also, like all aspects of our faith, we need to act on it. Amen? Let me tell you something, folks. There are some people who are some of the best excuse makers going. They have an excuse for why they can't do something all the time. Wait till God hears your excuses. He hears them, but he's going to make you tell him. Right? Why wouldn't you do this? Well, God, you know, I was so busy. Oh, you mean everybody else at Church of Pentecost isn't busy? Just you? Well, God, you know, I don't do well with, with people. Oh, but everybody else does except you. I must not have put that in you. I don't think God's going to accept a lot of our excuses. I really, really don't. And, I, and let me tell you something. I really feel that if some of us would get off of our duffs and start doing more, God would bless more. Maybe loved ones might be even saved. Now, I'm not saying that they're not saved because you won't do certain things. But there's things that we can do to show people, man, this person really loves God. This person really loves their church. Huh? I'm saying it makes a difference when you put your all into things. You know, you got that worker that's uh, half-hearted. Then you got that one that just, man, he's like buzzing. <laughs> Who gets the raises? Huh? Who gets the raises? How about it, Carl? Who gets the raises? The zoo person? Who gets the blessings in the church? That person that just said, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll be there. I'll do this. I'll, come on. Like all aspects of our faith, we need to act on the things of God. There's, let me tell you, you can't pick and choose in the word what you want to do. Come on. We have to accept it all. We may not necessarily like all of it, but we have to accept it all. So we need to actively love our brothers and our sisters in Christ. We need to encourage one another in our faith, pursuing unity and overcoming disunity. We do this, and there are many ways. But it starts, hear me, it starts with intentional pursuit of the church, namely the people of God. See, Christian activities such as small groups and Bible studies and prayer meetings and getting involved with the church are great starting points to experience fellowship. It takes intentionality, folks, because fellowship does not always come easy. You have to be intentional. It takes perseverance because loving one another can be very hard. Amen? It takes conviction. That is something we must pursue because the Lord has commanded it, and so we must pursue it wholeheartedly. Romans 12, 9 through 13. Don't just pretend to love one another. Really love them. Hate 
what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection. And take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Know that? Do you know God said always be eager to practice hospitality? Eager. Why aren't we eager? Some of you guys are funny. When I ask certain questions, all the heads drop. You got to be up here sometimes. <laughs> be eager. Come on. You know what, folks? We have to love one another. We have to love. There are five functions that are essential for a healthy, effective church. We have to connect with one another in fellowship. We have to grow in Christ through discipleship. We have to serve others in ministry. We have to go into the world and make disciples. We have to worship God. How many want to be an effective church? All right, here's what we got to do, okay? Let me read it again. Connect with one another in fellowship. Grow in Christ through discipleship. Serve others in ministry. Go into the world and make disciples and worship God. What can we do in practical ways to connect with each other in this church? And those who are new to our church family, we have to connect. Romans 12, 9 through 13. Let your love be sincere. In other words, a real thing. Hate what is evil. Loathe all ungodliness. Turn in honor from wickedness, but hold fast to that which is good. Love one another with brotherly affection as members of one family. Giving precedence and showing honor to one another. Never lag in zeal and in, and in earnest endeavor. Be a be and glow and burning with the Spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoice and exalt in hope. Be steadfast and patient in suffering and tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of God's people, sharing in the necessities of the saints. Pursue the practice of hospitality. You see, connecting with one another is an essential element becoming a healthy biblical church community. Jesus is the example of how we can effectively connect with people. Peter has finished all night. You know, he has, I'm sorry, he has fished all night. And the Bible says he caught nothing. Now listen to me. Peter fished all night. He's, this is a professional fisherman. Caught nothing. And Jesus directed them to put their nets out. And the boat the Bible says, began to sink. Why? Because it has so many fish. Now, hear me. Some of us are professional Pentecostals. And we think that we should be, you know, we, well, we think, we think, we tell ourselves we think that we should be witnessing. But usually we believe everybody else ought to witness. Come on. Let everybody else do it. Now, here it is. Professional Peter. And Jesus walks up and says, do what I tell you. He knows he's tired. They've been up all night. Throwing out nets, pulling them in, nothing. Throwing out nets, pulling them in, nothing. And Jesus comes up and says, listen to me, Peter. He directed them to put their nets out. And Peter said, nevertheless, at thy will. And he put the nets out. And the Bible says the boat began to sink with many fish. So much so that they brought another boat. Folks, it was after 
See, Jesus directed them to put their nets out, and the boat began to sink. It was after meeting his needs that Jesus called them to be his disciples. After God met Peter's needs and the disciples, he, then he called them to be his disciples. All right? Because Jesus met the need, Peter and several others deci decided to follow Jesus. I'm telling you today, folks, God wants to meet your needs. But we have to say, okay. Okay. Nevertheless, God wants to help us to become his disciples. We have to be observant of people and their needs. There's some people that want to live for God. But we, as his disciples, have to be observant of their needs. Because he told us to make disciples. Right? Sometimes they just need us to help them in certain areas. Sometimes they just need a friend. Sometimes they just need somebody to sit across the table from in, in communion with food and say, Hey, how can I help you? How can I be a blessing to you? I love you. I want to be what you, whatever you need. And if we can meet that need in that person's life, folks, they will become disciples of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, we go about it so wrong sometimes. Come on, folks. Let's be honest right here. What's the extent of our witness? Want to go to church with me tonight? How many have heard it for years? Invite somebody to church. How about meeting their need? How about discipling them? Jesus met Peter and the disciples' needs. And then he said, be my disciples. Be observant of people around you and their needs. Be observant of people who come to church here at Pentecost, Church of Pentecost. Be observant of them. How can I bless you? How can we become friends? So, as Christians, we need to be observant of people, and we need to be concerned about their needs. You see, we value every person that we come in contact with. We are to be sensitive to the what they perceive as their needs we must we first must focus on where they are and what they believe their need to be rather than drag people to where we are and what we think their need is if you just get up to this altar and you just pray through god will touch you you see we are disciples Right? We have, we have to see, meet their need so that God can continue. See, God didn't just say, just drag them to the altar and I'll take care of it. And you know, that's all you ever have to do. No, he never said that. We are to disciple them. Amen? You can't disciple somebody without fellowship. You hear me? We cannot disciple somebody without fellowship. So we are to value every person that we come in contact with. We are to care about their needs, their perspective of their needs. Amen. And then, now don't just think that well, if I drag them up there and they get the Holy Ghost, everything's done. Did my job. What this shows, folks, here, let me tell you. When you try to see and, and, and try to help them in their need, it shows a humility and a respect for that person. And this allows the opportunity for the Holy Ghost to work with us, work without us, and assuming his role. Amen? This also demonstrates that we are to treat people as people rather than a project. Come on. And when we do this, trust can begin to take root. People matter to Jesus. And even those that we were culturally, we think are culturally unacceptable, they matter to Jesus. You see, in Jesus' day, a man would not, would not typically have a conversation with a woman who was not a family member or someone of a different ethnicity. 
But see, folks, that did not matter to Jesus. One day, after a long journey, Jesus rested as a, at this well in, in, in Samaria. And he, the rest of the disciples went to town. He sent them off to go find food. And soon a woman came alone to the well to draw water. And it was from this occasion that Jesus entered into a conversation. And it was not a one-sided conversation. Jesus did not just talk or preach. Jesus listened. We have to learn to listen. Hear me. We have to learn to listen. Well, bless God, if you just obey Acts 2.38. Look right here. Look, in Acts 2.38, if you just do this, learn to listen. How can I help you? Talk to me. So, folks, as Christians, we need to learn to dis discipline. We need to learn to the discipline of listening. Listening takes effort. Amen? I'll say it again. Listening takes effort. Either we are impatient to earnestly follow the, what someone is saying, or we are focused on what we are going to say when given the opportunity. We need to learn to ask questions in order to make sure that we are understanding what is being said. Listening demonstrates respect. Sincere listening is one of the key ingredients to building trust. You know what I've found? That sometimes if you just let people talk, they talk out and, and they, they fix the situation themselves. I've had many people <laughs> sit across my desk and, and, and I'm, I'm just letting them talk and, and all of a sudden they're like, I just fixed the problem. <laughs> Amen? I'm like, good, let's go. We're done. No, I didn't. I let him talk more. But listening opens the door for the Holy Spirit to use you to help others. You, folks, I'm pray whenever I talk to somebody, I'm praying. You know what I'm praying? God, I don't want them to hear me. I want them to hear you. So, Lord, you speak to me. Give me wisdom to help them. Because it ain't, anything I say is not going to really help. It's what God speaks through. I'm that vessel. So sincere listening is one of the key ingredients to building trust. Listening opens the door for the Holy Spirit to use you to help others. And listening is essential for, for meaningful connection. And when you need, when you read the Gospels, one of the, one of the characteristics that Jesus demonstrates is compassion. Jesus was and is compassionate. And one day, as Jesus was traveling in the town of Nain, he and his, his disciples walked right into a funeral. The man who died was the only son of a widow in Luke 7, 13 through 15. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the barrier. And, and they, they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man... I say unto thee, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. Demonstrate compassion. As Christians, we should know, or we should be known for our compassion rather than our judgment. Compassion opens the door for an effective evangelism. Compassion demonstrates that people truly do matter. And it shows that we are more concerned about others than ourselves. Putting people down, bullying them has always been a part of the human experience. And during the ministry of Jesus, there was a blind man that was the subject of the conversation among the disciples. And they questioned whether the man was blind because of his sin or his parents' sin. So they were going back with this debate. Is he blind because he sinned or is he blind because his parents' sin? Doesn't sound like compassion to me. But Jesus brought correction to the disciples 
views. In John 9, verse 3, neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Then Jesus healed him. And because Jesus healed him on the Sabbath, the religious leaders viewed this as a violation to the law. Because the man would not condemn Jesus, these leaders excommunicated him from the community. Listen about this. In John 9, 35, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one that's speaking, speaking to with you. The man said, Lord, I believe and worshiped him. You see, Jesus healed him. He was showing compassion. But Jesus also would never, ever ignore the weak. Folks, Jesus would protect the weak. So as Christians... We are to protect the weak. We must have a heart for the lonely, the hurting, and the marginalized. Jesus said to his followers in Mark 9, 35, he sat down and called the 12 over to him and said, whoever wants to be first, listen to this, whoever wants to be first must take last place and be the servant of everyone else. We should never ignore injustice, especially in the church. We must reach out to everyone around us and not assume that someone else will not, somebody else will do it. Hear me, folks? I'm going to say it again. We must reach out to everyone around us and not assume that somebody else will do it. And throughout Jesus' ministry... He demonstrated grace and kindness, even those that took a, took a long time to understand the truth that he preached. So when you look at a disciple like Peter, you see a man who took several years to finally get it and finally understand the person and the work of Jesus. Jesus even took Peter in after he denied him in the shadow of the cross. And thank the Lord that he took Peter in. Thank the Lord that he showed Peter this kindness. And we also have to be patient. Jesus was patient. He was patient with a man like Peter. As Christians, we need to be patient with people. We need to remember that we have not arrived at spiritual perfection. If we want others to be patient with us, we need to be patient with others. You see, it is the heart and the meaning of the golden rule. Connecting with one another is an essential element in becoming a healthy, biblical church community. Folks, hear me today. We need to be observant of people and their needs because Jesus was. We need to learn to listen because Jesus listened. We need to be compassionate because Jesus was always compassionate. We need to protect the weak because that is what Jesus did. And that is what he still does. Amen. We need to be patient because God is patient with us. Folks, as disciples, hear me today. You are, if you love God, you, you need to be a disciple. God wants you to be his disciple. But a disciple must learn. To do what he needs to do. Now listen again. I, I've said this several times today. Some of us have been around for a long time. And I'm telling you we need to change some things. I really feel the Lord pushing me to understand that we are disciples. And we need to act like disciples. And we need to disciple others. Come on. We need to disciple others. As disciples of Jesus, we need to disciple other people. Fellowship is a great way to disciple people. Fellowship happens at church. Fellowship happens at small groups. Fellowship happens in your home. Fellowship happens wherever. And I encourage each of us here at Church of Pentecost to be 
the disciple that Jesus has called us to be. And join a small group and fellowship. Make your group the best it can be by your participation. Some of you, hear me today. Listen up. Everybody listening? Some of you are to the point where you can lead a small group. It's time you step up. Because I want to hear the excuse you're going to give Jesus. Come on. Step up. We need more leaders. Amen? Let's rise. Let's stand. Amen. We thank the Lord for each of you here, folks. And God wants to take us. We, we need to move on. Okay? We need to grow up. There comes that point where you tell your kid, it's time for you to get your little tail out of this house. Come on. Get you a job. Get you an apartment. Right? I'm not tying your shoes when you're 25 years old. Give me that pacifier, too. Right? It's time for us to grow up. It's time for us to be what God wants us to be. I encourage you. Some of you need to be talking with Brother Nate and saying, I want to be a small group leader next week. Now, he's going to run it by me. So don't get mad if he comes back and says no. But I'm going to be wide open, though. Okay? Some of you can't lead yourself. I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> oh my sometimes I don't know why I say some things <laughs> they're saying feed the man <laughs> let's pray as we go down to fellowship let's pray over the food amen heavenly father we love you we thank you God we ask you Lord that you just touch and bless here today God bless this food and bless this fellowship in the mighty name of Jesus, and I pray, Lord, help everybody here know I love them. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.